Today's scripture is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 to verse 23. Verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it's written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in man, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This is God's word. Please be seated. Today, you're going to see people on the stage singing and making music, speaking, praying, and teaching. These people are talented. These people are beautiful. And we love these people. But you got to know something. Today, there will be people sitting near you. These are good people. They may already share a deep bond with you, or they may be complete strangers. You might even wonder what they're thinking of you. But you know what? Today, at some point, you'll be invited to look at the person in the mirror. We think you're beautiful. God thinks you're beautiful. In his eyes, you are worth everything. But here's the truth. This day and every day, it's all about him. It's all about a holy God who took the form of man, who lived and died and rose again, full of grace and full of truth. It's all about the one who sits enthroned at the right hand of the Father. The one who, at the very mention of his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Our worship, our praise, and our extended focus is all about Jesus. And our surrendered response is simply to worship him, just to worship him. Because this is not about us at all. This is all about And it is all about him. Everything that goes on around here is all about him. Everything. It's for his glory. We've sung the songs this morning. It's for his glory. It's for his glory. You know, the Lord is very jealous about his glory. He's told us many times in the Bible that he will not share his glory with anybody or anything else. That's because it's his exclusively. Nobody else is worthy of that glory. But here's what we do get. We get the blessings. We get the blessings that come from God. And when the glory goes to God and the blessings flow upon his children, wonderful things happen among his people. Wonderful things. This morning, I'm kind of wanting to brag just a little bit about some of our folks, and actually about all of our folks in one way. The first thing I, I want to say is how pleased I am that everybody puts all these different parts and pieces together for our worship experience. We have a choir, they practice hard. We have a pianist, she she practices hard, they practice hard. And we have the team up above and they work very hard. And the ushers, they come. And Brother Tony, he leads. And all of this flows together as God by his spirit just moves among us. And it's a precious and wonderful thing. And I want to brag on all of us. You know, last week we had a tremendous report a tremendous report about the mission team 
And we had people sharing all that God did. And it was so special to me to watch you as a people in an unannounced, completely unannounced, spontaneous, out-of-the-box kind of offering. You gave more than a thousand U.S. dollars spontaneously to missions, to our unified budget. Do you know you've done that? I, I was just blown out of the water. I know it wasn't in the bulletin. I know we don't do that often, but maybe we ought to consider that and maybe make new traditions. You know why? Because how did traditions become traditions? People found them to be important once upon a time. And missions is our heartbeat. That's who we are as a people. Why not the best? Why not the best? Why not give God the best? We had a president of the United States. He wrote, that was a book title that he had, Why Not the Best? And honestly, truly speaking, oftentimes we don't get to the best because we are content to take second best. Because we are too often content to just accept the good. Hear me say this. The worst enemy that the best ever had is the good. It's not the bad. You see, if it's bad, we can shun that. But the good that can come upon us, you know, we can get comfortable with good things like our traditions and like the way we've always done things. We can get very, very comfortable with that if we're not very careful. Why not the best? Why not the best? Why not the best? Sometimes what keeps us from the best is a very limited perspective about life. What keeps us from God's very best is that we often have tunnel vision. We get so focused on this life that we cannot see beyond our immediate circumstances. The church at Corinth was filled with people who were struggling struggling because they were on the verge of losing their sense of eternality. They were on the verge of losing the overarching 
big picture in their life. And the Apostle Paul was writing to this church at Corinth. And I believe God, by His Spirit, is speaking to our church today, calling us, telling us that we also, we also must look beyond our temporary circumstances and look deeply into life not only this life, but into life. Because when he talks about life in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul uses the word zoe, which is the Greek word for eternal life. When he tells the church everything belongs to them, he, including life, he means eternal life. He keeps calling the church back to eternal values. There are false foundations that can keep us from God's very best. One of the false foundations is this foundation of self. This idea that I must promote myself. We live in a world that teaches us everything wrong from an eternal vantage point. We live in a world that tells us that if it's going to be, it's up to me. Promote yourself. Make yourself look good. Sell yourself. Get over. Make it happen. And those are the very values that if they're imported into the family of God will keep us from realizing our eternal destiny and being able to grow and have God's very, very best for our lives. Self-achievements can be the very thing if we focus upon them that will cause us to go downhill spiritually. And the idea of we want the opinion of others so desperately, so desperately do we want this the status seekers. We've got to have the right clothes. We've got to have the right car. We've got to have the right, and you fill in the blanks. You see, the problem with these right things, quote, unquote, is that they are but temporary, only temporary. One day, everything that you see will give out, will rust, will ruin, will fade away. And only that which is eternal will be done Stand, will be standing at the end of time. Eternity. Very, very important concept. Next, please. How is it that we cannot have the best? How is it that we can get kind of messed up and have this parochial perspective of life, this limited uh, objectives of life? How can it happen to us? 
It can happen very easily if we forget how lost we were and why it was that Jesus died on the cross. Oftentimes, the longer we serve the Lord Jesus, if we're not very careful, we can develop a sense of spiritual amnesia. And the accomplishments that we have experienced and the good things that we have done can be the very things that can cause us to forget how lost we were and the awesome price that had to be paid for our eternal salvation. We were not just maladjusted. We were not just struggling psychologically. We were not just struggling relationally. We were not just struggling in life. We were dead in trespasses and sin. And we were on our way to hell. And it's too easy to forget that. And too easy if we forget that to not see the magnitude of the mercy that was shown to us by Jesus Christ. The best foundation is that one, the only one, verse 11, that tells us, and yes, I know that in the bulletin we started at a different place, but to catch the flow of what Paul is telling the people, go home and read it in your Bible. And you can see in verse 11 that he says there's only one foundation for life. Only one. Only one foundation that can be laid, and that's Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation that can ever be laid in a life that can stand the test of time, but that is the very best foundation that anyone can have in their life. Every person is trying to build foundations in their life. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I will say to you without apology and say to you as lovingly and gently as I know how to, the foundation that you're building on is a flawed foundation. It, it, it will fail you. It is crumbling. It will never do for you what the best foundation, Jesus Christ, can do for you. Jesus, God's grace, that's poured out upon his people, poured out for all of us. For whosoever will, God's grace. And the next, please, to build. Why not build a life? Why not build our lives with quality material that can stand the test of time? Why not? The Apostle Paul in verse 12 talks, speaks clearly to those who would be building the church, and it speaks to us about part uh, being part of that church as we're building our lives to build from the perspective of eternity using non-combustible material, using gold and silver and jewels, that which the fire of the day of the Lord cannot burn. And please hear me say, there is a day coming when the fiery judgment of God will come upon the earth and that day is when Jesus returns. And those of us who have been building with gold and silver and jewels, we will see that that which we have been using for building material, a building on that foundation of Jesus, that will stand the test of that fire and we will receive a reward. And those who build with combustible building materials, non-quality materials of hay and wood and straw, that will be burned up by the fiery judgment of God. You say, fiery judgment? I thought God was a loving God. He is a very loving God. And he's also a fair and just God. And how can God be a fair and just God if he does not also judge among his people? That's what Romans 3, 6 says. That's what 1 Peter 4, 17 says. That's what Hebrews 12, 29 says. Our God is a consuming fire. And he will assess and judge the works of his church. You know what happens to us? Why we lose our sense of eternality? We get at ease in Zion. Oh, I took Jesus 25 years ago as my Savior. I took Jesus 30 years ago as my Savior. I'm going to heaven Wonderful. Hallelujah. Do you also know that when you stand before the Lord, he's going to ask you, how have you built your life? What kind of building material did you build into your life? Did you build with gold, 
the gold of godly character? Did you build with silver of surrendered spiritual service to your master? Jewels, did you build with generosity in your life? What kind of jewels, what kind of combustible material are we using? That's a question that the Apostle Paul was bringing to the front of the mind of, the, of those who would build in Corinth. And he's, he's bringing that to our mind, calling to us today, asking us one day, when we stand before him, will we have rewards or will we stand with empty hands saying, Lord, all, all I can bring is myself. All I can bring is myself. That power is in our hands. It's in our hands. How will we build? Well, we will build when we have the best outlook on life. Though I've been serving the Lord for more than 40 years, I still have a sense of eschatological accountability. Coming from the Greek word eschaton or eschatos, meaning the end times. That means that I know that I'm still accountable as unto the Lord to declare the whole truth of God to the people of God. To know that one day I'll stand before him and it's my deepest desire to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Eschatology is the study of the last things that has to do with death and judgment and heaven and hell. And not only will I stand before the Lord, but we will stand before the Lord and every one of us will stand before him on that day. And to have that attitude in our life, to have that outlook in our life will call us away from kind of taking it easy and coasting through life on the beds of comfort. The beds of comfort. You see, it's that which calls us to the holiness of God. It's that which calls us to determine that all of our lives we want to see how close we can live to God and how, how dear we can become in his heart and him in our hearts. I heard the story of a man who was looking for a chauffeur and he, he was interviewing people and he asked one chauffeur, he said, listen, he said, these roads are narrow going around the mountains of, of where we live how close can you get me to the edge without going over? First candidate said, I can get you within a foot. Oh, I don't know if I like that. The second candidate said, I can get you within six inches. And I don't like that. And the third guy said, listen, I'm going to keep as far away from that as I know how to be because I'm going to stick close to the mountainside so we don't go over the edge. When we have that kind of mindset, when that eternal holiness grasps us we no longer have to ask the question what's acceptable in God's sight and what isn't because we are so concerned with his glory so filled with his holiness so aware that we're going to give an account that the answers to our questions start bubbling up on the inside as God by his spirit through his word teaches us and grows us 
we have a sense of awe and reverence for God Almighty. How would our worship service change if we knew that when we gathered together that God Almighty, by His Spirit, was in our lives, transforming this time, changing it from just doing a religious duty thing to an encounter, a living, vital experience with God? Would we take it so easy? Would we take it so lightly? Would we come dribbling in late if we come at all? How would it transform our lives, dear brothers and sisters, if that sense of holiness, that awe, that reverence would come upon us? It keeps us from having the best. Why not the best? When I see that, why not the best? Why not? Why not the best for our lives? Why not the best wisdom? That is the best wisdom. The wisdom of the cross of Christ. That's the best wisdom there is. To not have that for one's foundation of life is not a wise thing. There, there are two different words I want to introduce. One is B-I-R-G and one is C-O-R-F. Social psychologists say this is a social identification theory. You know what it means? It Basically, it means basking in reflected glory. That means like, okay, my UK Wildcats, they are 33 and 0. Oh, they've not lost a game this season. Wow, aren't I somebody because I'm basking in their reflected glory. The only glory worthy of basking in is the glory of the Lord Jesus and the wisdom that God gave us in Him. C-O-R-F means cutting off. 
cutting off reflections or reflected failure. It's like this. Oh my, my political candidate didn't win, so I'm soon going to pull the sign out of my front yard that says vote for so-and-so. It means my basketball team didn't win, so I'm going to take off my jersey. I'm not even going to comment when I leave the uh, arena if my team loses. It's, it means that, that that which the world would reflect is the very thing that we're called to bask in the glory of. And the very thing that the world basks in the glory of is that which we are called to do away with and to cut out and cut off. That's the best wisdom found in verses 18 and 20. You may say, well, now, I, I don't have any of that. Oh, yeah? Uh, if your child is number one in their class, do you like the glory? And young people, don't, don't, don't be saying, well, now, wait a minute, that, that's for those old folks. No, no, uh, it's not. Uh, who's your favorite pop idol, music star? You like to buy their stuff, and you like to wear the jerseys, and it's kind of like lean sanity that took place for a while. You remember Jeremy Lean that came, and everybody went, whoa, okay, he's tied with ease, and, and now we're together, and, and, and now we can bask in that reflected glory. The only glory we're called to bask in is the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ the only glory next please the best freedom the Son shall make you free you're free indeed the Apostle Paul was wanting the church at Corinth and and obviously I want us all and God wants every one of his churches to have this understanding that the best freedom is freedom that's found when we are under authority when we know who we are when our identity is rooted and grounded in what Jesus Christ has done for us plus nothing else our identity as the owner of everything. Did the Apostle Paul not say, you are owning everything. Paul belongs to you. Cephas, everything is yours. The world, the life, the future, it all belongs to you. You're the owner of everything. That's your identity. Don't settle for second best. Don't sell yourself short. It's what the Apostle Paul is saying to the church at Corinth. And I believe what God, by His Spirit, is telling us as a church to not sell ourselves short, to retain and to solidify our identity in Christ. And we're the owners of everything. But that doesn't mean that it all belongs to us. It means that we are the stewards of that which God has given us to own. You see, it's easy to say, I want to be in authority. But let me tell you, in order to be over something, you first have to be under something. And that something you have to be under is the authority, living authority of the Lord Jesus. Because if you're not under that authority, whatever it is you think you are in charge of is really in charge of you. Did you hear that? Did you get that? Are, are you with me on this? If you don't realize that you are under God's authority, whatever else you may think you're in charge of, you're not. It's in charge of you because you spend your time trying to protect it and keep it instead of being a steward of that which God gives to you. And a disciple, what does it mean? It means to become more and more like Jesus. More and more like Him. That's our identity. When the Apostle Paul said, all things are yours, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God, he's saying, just like Jesus was obedient to the will of his Father, he grew, and so are we to grow in that kind of obedience fleshing out day by day, step by step, that will of God.
free to serve. Free to serve. Why not the best? God gave his best when he gave us Christ. Do you have his best? Do you want his best? Do you give your best? Let's stand. We're going to have a verse of invitation. And I'm going to ask you to allow the Spirit of God to speak into your heart. These questions. Do you have his best? Do you want his best? The best is in Jesus Christ if you don't know him. If you do know him, the best needs to be given back to him. And remember, he gave his very, very best for you and for me. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask our sisters to come forward if she will. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. Father, this invitation is for you. It's for you to teach our hearts, to speak to us, to call us to yourself, possibly to come forward publicly, but most definitely to decide in the interior of our hearts responding to you. In Christ's name I pray we offer this invitation. Amen.